The last module of chapter one will focus on neuroscience, attachment, and sociocultural of the fundamentals of lifespan development. Neuroscience is the scientific study of the nervous system, that is, the brain and the spinal cord. When we look at developmental cognitive neuroscience, you basically are looking at the way our cognition changes as we grow uh, and as a byproduct of our maturation of the brain. So this particular field studies the relationship between the brain changes and the way a child's growth impacts the behavior patterns. This is where we study why a three-year-old should behave like a three-year-old, meaning they should be able to move, they should be able to say uh, words that should be in part of their vocabulary. When we spot a difference in comparison to the pattern, we are able to establish that there is uh, an abnormality, an anomaly that should be looked at further. Now, the questions that we ask or that seek uh, answers in this, in this particular field are uh, the transformations in the brain systems and how that makes it difficult for perhaps someone to be able to engage in certain behavior. For example, you may have noticed that if anybody uh, comes to the United States uh, from another country where English is not the first language, it is not unusual for the child, uh, if younger than the age of 12, to acquire the language skills very rapidly. However, if someone comes at a later age, uh, say after the age of 15 years of age, then it is likely that even though the person may live here for 30 years, their accent will not completely disappear. And that is because of changes in the brain as we mature. So the question is, uh, is the brain a plastic component? By plastic we mean it changes, or um, is it not? The answer is, is that it is a plastic um, tissue. Uh, it adapts to what we see in there, and it can be seen through skills, capacities, and behaviors. However, that plasticity disappears uh, as we get older. Or, if not disappears, it definitely is less noticeable. Attachment is one of the primary uh, components of individuals who study uh, development of the child. And the reason why is because this is considered to be uh, an, emo an emotional bond that allows us to survive. Without attachment, especially as humans, it is very unlikely that a child will be able to survive. Uh, and that is, if the mother does not uh, provide the care for the child, or if the child feels this, that they are not cared for. So we're going to look at this in here and how that comes to impact us uh, later in life. Now, the first study of attachment was brought forth by Conrad Lorenz uh, in the 1960s, and this came forth after looking at uh, goslings, these uh, little ducks that were still in their eggs prior to hatching. Uh, were observed in a laboratory. And one of the things that Conrad Lorenz and his colleagues noticed was that as these little ducks' uh, eggs were hatching, uh, they would begin to uh, form an attachment toward the first moving object. So if there was a lab worker there, then the goslings would begin to follow with their eyes, and eventually they would begin to follow uh, everywhere this person went. And this is what he called imprinting. Now, imprinting makes sense, and it's been uh, portrayed in cartoons when you see a little baby chick uh, calling a zebra mom, and that is because of the attachment that is seen. However, uh, that does not occur with adults. If that were to be the case, then we would most likely be attached to a doctor, the nurse, the midwife, or whoever we saw when we were born. Because of this uh, issue with imprinting and that particular theory, other researchers have studied attachment in different forms. Here you could see a little monkey who was separated from, at birth from his mother, and uh, they gave him two, uh, two particular figures uh, in the cage where he lived. One figure, as you can see, is a very unattractive uh, cage with no uh, facial features, but it has uh, a formula here, which is uh, the food. Uh, the other cage on the right side has a much more human-like face with a smile and big eyes, and then it also has a warm cloth around it. The question Harry Harlow and his team of researchers had was whether the monkey would prefer the warm cloth 
uh, that the figure on the right had, or if they would prefer to be uh, next to the food and having access to food. Surprisingly, what they found is that the baby monkey would spend the majority of his time with the warm uh, figure, and that is what was providing uh, a secure environment for the monkey who was um, not exposed to, to his mom. Uh, whenever the monkey's hunger would reach high levels, then they would reach over, and then as soon as he was done, would go back. As you can see right here, the monkey figured out a way through his cognition to not leave the warm uh, figure and yet still acquire food. The conclusion of this in here was that milk alone is not sufficient to create a secure attachment. Uh, the argument and conclusions by Harry Harlow and others is that the more responsive caregivers are to a baby, the more likely it is that the child will be securely attached to the caregiver and as you will see later also to their romantic uh, partners later in life and what we mean by responsive to baby signals is that since they cannot speak yet and it is only through language uh, excuse me it is only through crying through smiles and through other gestures that we ought to be uh, mindful of and looking out for Attachment alone has been studied by researchers uh, for decades now, uh, and thankfully uh, we are now living in a society that uh, recognizes the importance of the cultural component uh, to a person's well-being. Vygotsky uh, contributed to, uh, to our discipline with this sociocultural theory in which he focused on the importance of culture uh, so that the next generation could survive and be able to carry on those important uh, rituals, those important morals and, and, and views of society. Uh, Vygotsky viewed social interaction as uh, an essential component for a healthy personality. And what social interaction is basically the dialogue and interaction between the young members of a society and the more experienced members of society. According to Vygotsky, this is essential for a person uh, to succeed in any particular culture. That is that to say that if a person is detached from their culture, they may not be able to uh, in interact well with members of their society. For example, if I am not in touch with my grandma's culture and I do not speak with her, uh, then the wisdom and the advice that she could provide for me uh, may not be there uh, because of that uh, disconnect from my culture. So he argued that uh, children in every culture will develop unique strengths uh, and abilities based on interacting with, with people. If you've had the chance to travel uh, outside of the United States, you may have noticed that there are these specific abilities and, 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 and strengths that are demonstrated by children that sometimes even without um, knowledge of, uh, of um, that could be acquired typically in schools, they can still carry on a business. For example, going over to Mexico and seeing kids maybe selling um, gum and candy at the streets, they don't seem to have an understanding of numbers, but yet they know exactly how much they owe you, uh, or you, excuse me, how much you owe them if you were to get four pieces of candy. So important to see how some of these skills, cognitive skills, can be acquired even without proper schooling. The last uh, theory that I'd like us to look at here in this module is the ecological systems theory. Uh, and this ecological systems theory falls under the category of sociocultural theories in which it views a child as a, uh, uh, as a member of a society that is made up of multiple layers. And these layers is what he called a system. Now, the system that um, <clears throat> is presented by Brunfenbrenner, who is the uh, author and the guy who came up with the theory, basically says that our life is uh, very complex as it is affected by a lot of different levels in our surrounding environment. He looks at the microsystem as being the individual uh, and most uh, intimate part of, the, uh, of our surroundings, and that would be for example, a child's immediate surroundings, mom and dad and siblings. The mesosystem would be the immediate settings, 
but uh, in relation to the child again. So the school they go to, the neighborhood where they grow up, the child care center, all those things uh, contribute to the child's ability to, to succeed or not. The exosystem, uh, though it seems to be detached from the child, it affects or benefits the child directly. Uh, and, and that is uh, the part of the social setting that does not necessarily contain the child, but that does affect it. So the community, the school, the extended family, all those things seem to be important in how one develops in our community. So when we look at children, uh, for example, from a, a wealthy environment where there is a lot of financial freedom and, and, and uh, abilities to engage in different activities, and we compare that child to someone who may live in a not-so-affluent uh, community, we are able to see the changes in there. Lastly, he looks at the macro system as uh, one who encapsulates the cultural values, the laws, and resources. Uh, and this, he argued, that would affect that support that could be given at the inner levels. So going back to the micro system, arguing that depending on how the laws are uh, being passed, this can directly affect our micro system and thereby having a uh, comprehensive and collective approach as to how you and I develop in our society.